The Soybean School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Pride Seeds, Preaxer Zemium Fungicide, and Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans. I'm Kelvin Hepner for Real Agriculture down at uh, the Big Iron Farm Show in Fargo, North Dakota, and uh, joined now by Joe Eichley, Extension Weed Scientist with North Dakota State University. And Joe, uh, north of the border, we're starting to hear more cases of water hemp being discovered. Uh, last year in Manitoba, we had our first sighting of Palmer amaranth as well. What have you learned in North Dakota when it comes to these weeds and what the best practices are that growers should know about them? Yes, yeah, so we've been dealing with water hemp here. Well, we, we could find it going back 30 years ago, but really the last decade, 15 years or so, water hemp's become a major problem for us, uh, especially in the southern Red River Valley. In the last five, 10 years, it's crept north, and as you said, it's made its way into Manitoba. And so, you know, some of the main things, uh, you know, what I start with, water hemp, palm amaranth, they're not redwood pigweed, they're not, we call it pal amaranth, you guys would call it green pigweed. So they're, they're more difficult to deal with than our, our more traditional pigweeds. Part of that is the herbicide resistance that's basically ingrained in the population. So the water hemp we have is definitely resistant to glyphosate and our group two or ALS inhibiting herbicides. Uh, so in, in uh, broadleaf crops, maybe things like a Mazamox. I know we call it Raptor, I think you guys call it the Save Trade name uh, up in Canada. And so that was kind of the, the first learning curve we had to get over is resistance to those two modes of action. Uh, some of our water hemp now, we are finding group 14 resistance, things like sulfentrazone, uh, femesophen, that type of chemistry, not widespread yet, but we have identified it. So that's kind of like the next learning curve in, in soybeans, uh, dry edible beans as well, that we'll have to figure out and get over uh, as far as controlling those weeds. And so, you know, we're here at the Soybean Council booth at Big Iron this week because we're promoting the fact that we need to stay more aggressive in soybeans uh, with water hemp and palmer amaranth. And so for us, that really starts, we need to have a pre-emergence herbicide down at application. And I really want two to three effective modes of action uh, in, in that program we use pre-emergence for water hemp. So if we start with that, given the year it'll buy us four, maybe six weeks. And then what we really like to target is that four weeks after planting, come back with an effective foliar herbicide plus some more residual. Uh, group 15 herbicides for those who know that uh, that number and that's basically your uh, your chlorocetamides like metolachlor uh, and again for trade names for us dual magnum warrant it would be acetochlor that type of chemistry for more residual in soybeans so that's kind of the, the base program we like to operate on and and uh, that's usually a really good start but I, maybe I should take a step back further and I you know what we also like to preach is if you have water hemp escapes in the field, that's now a water hemp field. And so for me, I'm, scouting almost goes out the window at that point. If you know you have water hemp, treat it like a water hemp field, design your program around water hemp, you'll pick up the rest of the weeds along the way. And really it's, it's the water hemp you're going after to clean up. So those are some of the learning curves and considerations for water hemp. Uh, and, and of course that you know, creeps further north for us and then over, uh, over the border as well. And it usually takes a year or two for folks to really get that message, and so that's why we like to get out of farm shows and, and make sure we try and stay as far ahead as we can, especially for the folks that aren't dealing with things like water hemp currently. Uh, Palmer amaranth is a little bit different for us. So we've kind of had, I don't know if you want to call it homegrown water hemp, you know, identified 10, 20 years ago, to has, has been creeping as we get more herbicide resistance. Uh, but with Palmer, we basically at first identified it 2018. And we found new infestations kind of each year uh, since then. And we're finding Palmer being imported through a number of different ways, contaminated equipment, animal feed, possible waterfowl movement, some unknown cases. And with Palmer, kind of each unique case we found might have a unique herbicide resistance portfolio or profile. So we found some that's just glyphosate resistant, can kill it with everything else. That's great, you know, for as far as management. We have found some with resistance to five different modes of action in the same population. And that's a lot more difficult to deal with. So that's really why we continue to hammer home on Palmer Amaranth. It's relatively new. We don't know where it's coming from and what resistance we have when it gets here. And I suspect it would be the same for you guys up north of, we don't know where it came from, what it's resistant to. And that's why if we find those plants, 
hand pull them if it's a couple, get them out of there, don't let that plant get established. And right now is the time that we are probably finding them in soybeans, right? Yep, absolutely. And so we, we preach scouting all year long, but each year for us, it's really late August, early September is what I call pigweed ID season. That's when not a day goes by that I don't get a sample. Is this palmer? Is this water hemp? Is it red root or, or pal amaranth, one of the ones I'm not worried about? And so this is the time to really pay attention to those escapes. If you have a few plants, don't run it through the combine. It's the easiest way to prevent local spread within the field. Okay. So pre-emergence or pre-seed herbicide, getting that down, that's, that's the key in your books or in your mind? That, that's certainly the best starting point. And so uh, both palmer and water hemp are a lot more difficult to control once they're out of the ground. Uh, if you talk with people further south in the U.S. who have dealt with water hemp and palmer for 30 years, and it's kind of their main annual weed over the last 20, 30 years, the best success is never letting that seed germinate, emerge, get out of the ground. And so that's why it really starts with that pre-emergence herbicide. Uh, and, and then, like I said, once it's out of the ground, once we're over three inches tall, it becomes a lot more difficult to control. And some chemistry, once we're four or five inches tall, it actually becomes basically impossible to kill with, with certain chemistry. And that's not very tall. And so that's why we just, you know, hammer home, start with that residual. That's probably the key point to start with in a, in a water hemp control program. Do the soybean varieties that we're seeing come onto the market the last five, maybe 10 years, it is already, I'm not sure how long it's been that we've had these stacked herbicide tolerance traits on the market. Are those helping or is that uh, a tool in this as well? Yeah, so the, the, new, the new stacks that we have, so the dicamba tolerant soybeans, now we have dicamba and glufosinate, and the same thing, we have 240 and glufosinate, the enlisted soybean system. Yeah, I guess it's not 10 years, it's probably more five years since the first one, maybe. Yeah. Right, yeah, so it was, uh, 20, 2017 was the launch okay. of the extended soybean system, and those have certainly helped in the last, call it half a, half a decade, whatever it's been. However, uh, we have had some issues, uh, some commercial complaints, particularly this year with water hemp and then kochia as well, of dicamba not working as well in those dicamba soybean systems. And so, you know, especially with water hemp, uh, as, as much seed as it produces, the fact that it's already glyphosate resistant on basically every acre, it's unfortunately not too surprising to hear that. And we will be testing for resistance to dicamba this upcoming winter. And there's a good chance we'll find some. And so they've certainly helped but for folks who haven't really diversified their program or just gone to just post-emergence with dicamba twice twice a year maybe, those are some of the acres where we're seeing some issues on. And so again, you know, for overall management, if we start with that pre, it sets us up for good success. If those new soybean systems really help. Dicamba 2,4-D, glufosinate, all very effective on water hemp. But as I said, we're seeing some slippage now and I think it's mostly some of these acres that the pre-emergence herbicide was not the starting point, and we relied a lot on that post-emergence chemistry for control. Okay. Earlier you ran through some of the, the main ways that it's moving, the, the vectors. What are the most common ones, or what are some of the lessons you've learned there when it comes to how both these weeds are moving around North Dakota? Yeah, so as far as for water hemp, on, and the Red River Valley is primarily uh, flood water. And so that's, you know, that's no surprise or secret why it keeps creeping north each year. Every time we have a nice flood event, uh, we're going to have, because that seed floats. It's going to float wherever the flood waters settle and then drain, we're going to have some water hemp there. So that's a primary re uh, reason or uh, method near any water body. Um, contaminated equipment is also another primary method. And we think of the combine mostly, but that also includes tillage, even planters. Anytime we have dirt clinging to a piece of equipment, that can move uh, water hemp or palm ramran seed for that matter too. We do know waterfowl can move them. Uh, we're probably seeing quite a bit of that with water hemp in some areas of North Dakota where it's not problematic yet, but we see all of our sloughs and wet areas, all of a sudden there's water hemp where there wasn't water hemp before in those wet areas. And that's probably where waterfowl were, were laying and then pooping out some palmer or water hemp seed. I should say water hemp for our case. Palmer is a little bit different story. So those are the main ones for water hemp of how we're seeing kind of annual spread. Uh, with Palmer, as I mentioned, a number of different ways that we're getting Palmer into our state. Uh, a couple that are unknown, we haven't been able to figure out. Some used equipment uh, from Palmer Amaranth country. Uh, we've had some potential for custom combines, um, introducing the, some new plants into some new fields. Um, and then animal feed is probably our, our biggest introduction event uh, as a look across the state. 
And so there's two different animal feed sources that we really focus on for education. Uh, so we have had some contaminated sunflower screenings as a source. And so those are probably sunflowers produced outside of North Dakota. And then either uh, the end product or screenings at least being imported and sold for, for some pretty cheap cattle feed. And we've had Palmer pop up where some sunflower screenings have gone. The other one for us, not, uh, not the same volume as those screenings, uh, would be millet seed. So uh, we've had a pretty high correlation, uh, maybe the two out of the past five years, uh, with some German or foxtail millet. And it's not high levels of infestation, but we get to this time frame, uh, September, we're cutting the millet, and we'll see some tall palmer amaranth popping up above canopies. And so that's, that's really not a new, uh, that's not new knowledge across the U.S. There's been at least a dozen states where we've had palmer introduced through some millet seed but it's certainly gonna be an annual thing to look out for if we have some millet seed, particularly maybe some cheaper sources uh, that maybe weren't uh, screened or cleaned as well. So that, that's kind of the other place we're seeing it pop up and have annual concerns with that type of introduction. All right. Final question then, Joe. Are there any other weeds that are on your radar right now that you're paying attention to potentially coming into North Dakota or becoming issues in North Dakota? Are there any coming from Canada south? I know water and <laughs> and cropping trends move north, so they tend to go that way. But are, yeah, I don't know. Are there any other, any other ones on your radar that you're co potentially concerned about? You know, some of the other ones that we're concerned about, um, they've been here for a while, or, or you know, some that you know Canada's dealt with some. So in western North Dakota, so maybe western Manitoba, narrowleaf hawksbeard. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one that's becoming a bigger problem for us in the western part of our state. Uh, horseweed or mare's tail for us, Canada fleabane, uh, once you cross the border. And that's ubiquitous and everywhere, but as we have more no-till, we're having more and more issues with that. The one unique one, it, it's certainly not new, we've had it as long as we farmed in North Dakota, would be wild oats. But we're starting to see some resistance to wild oats that you guys have been dealing with up in Canada for a while. So group one, group two, and then uh, resistance uh, and small grains certainly. And we're, and we're having some concerns with even um, oh, triolate. And so for us, the product Fargo. So we, we're certainly keeping a closer eye on wild oats uh, and, and the resistance growing in that. And that's really relegated the, is, the main issues to the northern tier of our counties. And I know that you guys have dealt with that type of resistance for a while. So I don't want to say it's, some back to yeah, okay. I don't say it's, it's creeping Sorry. south, but maybe we've had some exchanges yeah. along the way. Oh, <laughs> Glyphosate resistant kochia, is that something down here, that you have down here? Yes, so we do, and, and you know, five years ago with kochia, we kind of said we, we know we have glyphosate, glyphosate resistance. Uh, at that time, it's kind of like, well, we know it's out there, we don't have a good feeling for how much. Uh, certainly after last year and now into this year, we're, our message is now, if you have kochia, assume glyphosate resistance. And so I know uh, some recent surveys up, up in Canada, it's basically confirmed pretty similar I think about 70% or plus of populations, and we're dealing with pretty similar numbers. So, again, maybe some blue across, but I think a lot of that's kind of homegrown as well. All right. Well, thanks for your time and your vast insight on on weeds here, weed issues here in North Dakota, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on.